Good evening, everyone. Good evening, good evening, good evening, and welcome to another episode of Living the Liberated Life with Dr. KJ. I am your host, Dr. KJ, and this is a wonderful month. This is the month of April, and we are so excited that you have decided to join us tonight. You all know that I love the month of April. April has so many great causes, but one of the best things about the month of April is I was born in it. So all the April babies out there, come on, put your hands together chair 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 Woo-hoo! and not only is this a special birthday um because every day every year is a special opportunity just to celebrate but i'm gonna be the big five oh in just 11 days so y'all cheer with me celebrate with me i'm celebrating all year long gifts cards you know all the wonderful things trips let's just do it let's live life to the fullest. And as we talk about living life to the fullest, tonight I am so honored that we would have the second installment of life altering experiences. Um, All throughout our lives, we have had experiences in our lives that have impacted us in major ways. But last month, about two weeks ago, we had a brother Chris Osborne, who came and shared his story about being an amputee early in his life uh, at the age of 30 something. He was an amputee and what life has been like for him as an amputee, wearing a prosthetic leg and all of those challenges that he's had to face. But now him being an advocate, him realizing that this is his ministry and that God has been blessing him. And um, it's been wonderful to see his growth. But tonight, tonight I have another brother beloved of this brother. We happen to have so many things in common. Our paths have crossed in so many ways. We've missed each other, but then the Lord allowed us to meet up here in Queens, New York. He is now the fine pastor of the Amity Baptist Church in Jamaica, Queens, South Jamaica, Queens. Stand up wherever you are. And he is none other than Pastor Jeffrey Thompson. Jeffrey Thompson has been through some stuff, y'all. He has turned his trial into triumph and he is a miracle. He is a living testimony. I mean, there's a song that says, I am a living testimony. I think I want Brother Jeffrey, Pastor Jeffrey, to learn that song for him to sing it the next time we're in a worship service together. I want him him to sing that as a solo. So I'm going to bring Pastor Jeff uh, off out from the green room, as we like to call it. And I want to welcome my brother beloved, Pastor Jeffrey Thompson. Hey. Hey, hey, I am a living testimony. (laughs) Good evening. Good evening. I should dead and gone. Yes. <laughs> but the Lord let me live on. Yes, indeed. What a joy it is to be with you tonight. Thank you so That's much. That's it. Thank that is so it. And by- Yes, by the end of tonight, I think all of those watching, if they will stay with us, they will be singing that song as well, and they will be able to celebrate with you. Uh, Pastor Jeff, tell me where you're from. Who is Jeffrey Thompson before we get into all that other stuff? All right. Well, I am a native of Brooklyn, New York. Amen. Um, I know I don't sound like it. People tell me I sound like I'm from Texas somewhere, but I am a native of Brooklyn, New York, born in the St. John's Episcopal Hospital on Atlantic Avenue. Um, And at the age of 10, my father was a pastor. And at the age of 10, without my permission, without my permission, my parents moved us to North Carolina. Uh, We would go, that's where my parents are from. We would go every summer and spend the summer in North Carolina. And this particular summer, when I was nine, about to turn 10, when it was time to go, they packed up the car. They told my brother and I to stay with our aunt. They'd see us in a couple of weeks. And the next thing I knew is that they were backing up a moving truck to what became the family residence on 1102 Atlantic Avenue in Goldsboro, North Carolina. So I am a native New Yorker, uh, but by way of Goldsboro, North Carolina. And I always wanted to get back to New York. Uh, from the time I left, because I didn't get a chance to say goodbye to friends and family uh, that were here in New York. And now uh, I, I just recognized recently that that's why I have separation anxiety, because I had a lot of friends, even at 10, had a little girlfriend at 10 mm-hmm. years old. That I didn't even get to say goodbye to. But uh, 
My but, lord. Yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> so I'm from I'm from Brooklyn, uh, but grew up in North Carolina and was able to come back to Brooklyn and move back into the neighborhood that I grew up in in 2003. Wonderful. And now what where is that near? Where is Gold, Goldsboro you said? It's 45 miles east of Raleigh. And uh, let me okay. give you a reference for it. Let me give you a reference for it. The movie American Gangster, uh, which Denzel played mm -hmm. in, and they were bringing drugs back from Vietnam. And they used Greensboro in the movie. But the guy who spearheaded that was from Goldsboro, North Carolina. So when everybody, I always ask if they've heard of Goldsboro, They've heard of it for one of three reasons. There's a big Air Force base there called Seymour Johnson Air Force Base. There's a mental institution, okay. state mental institution is in Goldsboro, or they know that the gentleman who was bringing drugs back from Vietnam is from Goldsboro, North Carolina. So that, that's, that's, <laughs> that's how it's famous, one of those three ways. And now we know that Pastor Jeff is, well, from Brooklyn, but grew up in Goldsboro, Goldsboro North Carolina. Like, like, like Michael North Jordan. Carolina. Michael Jordan was born in Brooklyn and then moved his parents moved him to North Carolina. And so Michael Jordan and I have something in common. Look at that. Look at that. <laughs> so that's wonderful. That's wonderful. So tonight, Pastor Jeff, you know, we have been friends for quite some time. And um I have known some of your struggles, uh, some of the challenges that you have had to face uh in life. And um just to see how God has shifted you through them. And I'd love for you to share with those that are watching uh, your story. I'd like us to hear your story tonight. Okay. All right. So um, about 20, well, first of all, let me start. I, when I was born, I was born with heart issues. I had a heart murmur, had heart issues. And I spent a lot of time as a child in the hospital, which is one of the reasons that I really am not fond of hospitals right now. I don't care what hospital I go in, there's a, a smell that I remember from my childhood that just, mm -hmm. it ruminates with me. And so I try not to go to hospitals as much as I can. But from a child, I had heart issues and um, they were, they were, I was told that I could live a normal life, everything would be fine. Um, and around 2012, uh, those issues started to resurface. Um, I, I would get short of breath. Um, and so, uh, went from 2012, I was, I was going to the hospital on a regular basis. I, I made a weekly stay at the hospital once or once a year from 2012 to 2018. And it got progressively worse. And in October of 2018, I had gone up to the, uh, state convention, the Empire Baptist, uh, missionary convention. Um, we were in Niagara Falls that year, I believe. And I had gone up to the convention and wasn't really feeling a hundred percent was probably about 50% and had gone to the convention, came back that Saturday. There was supposed to be a major snowstorm. I was scheduled to come back on Saturday. Uh, there was supposed to be a major snowstorm. So the airlines were allowing you to rebook your flights without uh, additional charge. So I came back on Friday and I rested all day Saturday, got up, pushed myself to go to church, on that Sunday, which was October the 28th. And in the middle of a spirited, high spirited worship service, I passed out. I went into cardiac arrest, um, had two persons in the church, two deacons at the time uh, perform CPR. Um, I don't remember passing out. Uh, the next thing I knew, I woke up and it was Thursday. The irony of that is that was the Sunday before we were to celebrate my 10th pastoral anniversary. We were going to have a banquet on that Thursday night, and we were going to have the anniversary celebration on that next Sunday, the first Sunday of November. But I passed out. I was in an, They told me I was in an induced coma. They kept me in that until Thursday. I woke up on Thursday, uh, began breathing on my own on that Thursday. Uh, first thing I asked was, where am I and why am I here? And they told me that I had passed out. Um, mm -hmm. They you know, the people who were there thought it was a heart attack. The doctors confirmed that it was not a heart attack. It was cardiac arrest. Uh, the difference being that with a heart attack, there's a plumbing problem. Something is blocked. With cardiac arrest, 
there is an electrical problem. There are loose nerve endings that fire. And so I had some loose nerve endings and um, went into cardiac arrest. Uh, thank God I woke up. They asked me uh, if I knew who the president was. And my answer was, unfortunately, it's Donald Trump. And so, so they said, he's okay. He's okay. He's, he's okay. He's all right. And so, um, mm -hmm. ironically, I was scheduled to have a defibrillator put in uh, the following week after the church, uh, after the pastor's anniversary. Uh, so I got a defibrillator put in and then just kind of left the hospital after a couple of weeks on pins and needles, wondering if it was going to go off, wondering what it was going to feel like when it went off. And, you know, um, fortunately, I was in church that morning because there were people around. If I had been home, I might not be here today. Um, so I was right. surrounded by a church, a loving church family. And I left the hospital with the defibrillator. And the first time it went off, I was in church at the Amity Baptist Church, a Wednesday night prayer meeting. And mm. I felt dizzy. My head fell back mm. and I felt a joke. And I said, what happened? And I said, I know what happened. My defibrillator just went off. And so went to the hospital, wow. hospitalized. They interrogated the defibrillator. It had indeed gone off. And I saw the electrophysician uh, and I told him, I said, you know, I was worried about when it would go off. It went off now. I'm worried about if it's going to go off again. I'm worried about is the battery strong enough? Is the, Could there be a malfunction? And without having good bedside manner, he said these words to me. You've got enough power for 99 more shots. <laughs> Wow. And I, wow. I, that, that was wow. that was not funny to me. I, I you know, but I, I just right. it had gone off. It had gone off a couple of times. Um, and in 2020, in July of 2020, mm -hmm. um, because of COVID, we were worshiping virtually and I was worshiping, uh, preaching in my house. And my defibrillator, defibrillator went off in the middle of service once again. And so I was, it's, it's funny because I was preaching, wow. um, we were doing kind of, I was doing some housekeeping matters. I was preaching about a housekeeping matter. And uh, I went back and listened to the tape later on. And when I passed out, somebody said, uh-oh, he shouldn't have said what he said. <laughs> but the, <laughs> the defibrillator was going off. Uh -oh. it was going off. <laughs> the defibrillator had gone off a couple of times. Wow. And so they wanted to have surgery. And we're talking about life. We're not talking about one life altering Ooh. experience. We're talking about multiple life altering experiences. They wanted to have surgery. And yeah, at so this they were point, gonna... we're at like, we're about three. Absolutely. At this point, it's like, like three life altering experiences. I, I, I feel, I feel yeah. like a cat. I feel like a cat. I might have about nine lives by the time we finish this conversation. Uh, but they wanted to do an ablation, which was to, <laughs> to burn some of the loose nerve endings so that they wouldn't fire. And during that procedure, the doctor lacerated my heart and I had began to bleed out. They had to open up my chest and stitch me up again. And so I came home from that um, just, just, you know, depressed and not understanding what was going on, not understanding why I was going through what I was going through. And unlike your guest last uh, two weeks ago, who said he never asked God why, I asked God why a whole lot of times. A whole lot of times in my one of my good friends, uh, I had the the uh, incision in my chest. And one of my good friends said to me, Doc, you got a zipper now. That was that was kind of like the 99 shot to me. I was like, <laughs> I was like, it was funny, but it wasn't funny. And so uh, the defibrillator went off a couple of other times and I began to get my heart began to get progressively weaker. And so uh, last year, um, in, in April, May or June, they had started asking me to come in because they, they'd been talking about me being a candidate for a transplant. And they said that I would be higher up on the list if I came in, check myself into the hospital, allow them to put a balloon pump in so that the balloon would do the pumping. And, you know, until I got a transplant, the, the, the concern and the issue was it was indefinite. They didn't know how long it would take for me to get a transplant. The second thing was 
But with the balloon, I had to lay on my back all day. I could not move. And I'm like, I'm a healthy, mm. well, pretty, I'm, I'm a fairly healthy young man, active young <laughs> man. There's no way I'm going to be laying on my back. You guys are going to have to put me in an induced coma for me to lay on my back. So I was concerned about that. But they came up with another option, which is called um, the Impala. It's a device that they put in, makes you, you're, you're able to be ambulatory and mobile, and it pumps your heart. Now, ironically, I was in Good Friday worship uh, just this past Friday, and a, a notification came across my phone. I looked at it, and the FDA is citing the manufacturer of the Impala because they said that the risk, the increase, the great risk had not been accurately reported because that device has caused 50 deaths in the last couple of years by that device lacerating your heart. And I felt like shouting wow. right there in the midst of that Good Friday service because yet again, the Lord had spared me from something, saved me. He saved me from wow. something so he could save me for something. And so um, yes. as I was in there, as I was in the hospital with the Impala, um, they, in, they, they didn't know when I was going to get a transplant and I needed a kidney transplant too. They wanted to do both at the same time, because what happens is they said they put a new heart in and it wears down the kidney and my kidney was already not functioning at 100. So they wanted to do them at the same time. But thanks be to God, after being in the hospital, not my, my anxiety, my fear, the unknown, how long I'm going to be here. Uh, they were, I was in the hospital for 14 days in July. And when I was being wheeled out, the gentleman who wheeled me out said, Hey, I just wheeled out a guy who's been here a year. He finally got a heart. I was like, bro, I don't need My to be right now because I'm not trying to be in the hospital a year. Um, but right. fortunately, thanks, thanks be to God, in 20 days, in 20 days, which people say is unheard of, in 20 days, mm. they came to me and said, get ready. We've got a we got two organs for you. And so I got a both two. a heart. Not one. Two. <laughs> two. I got a heart and a kidney transplant after being in the hospital 20 days. And um, I've got to tell you, I'm thankful to God uh, for God mm. looking after me. Um, I, I said to the congregation, I say all the time that indeed he's got his hands on me. He saved me from a whole lot of stuff for a whole lot of stuff. And so uh, that's kind of the story. And I'm thankful to be here. Indeed, I am a living testimony The people around EBA call me the living Lazarus. Yes, my God, because you you definitely have experienced life altering challenges one after another after another. And uh, I know so many people, you and I share a, a beloved friend who, you know, just went on to be with the Lord. And, um, and sometimes I wonder, how does that make you? As one who has been given, it seems as if the Lord has continued to give you chance after chance. What are some of you said, you know, what are some of the questions you ask yourself? Because as you shared, the guest last, two weeks ago, he shared that he never asked the Lord why. But you said right. you did. Talk to us well, about well, that. So fortunately, um, you and I share a mentor, a pastoral mentor, uh, Pastor H. B. Hicks. He taught me a long time ago that God can handle your questions. In fact, there's some great why questions that are asked in yeah. the Bible. Um, why has thou forsaken me? You know, and that came from the Lord, the lips of our Lord himself. So God can handle our questions. So I, I needed to know why me, God. Uh, I needed to know why now, God, why am I going through this? Uh, what are you trying to tell me? What are you trying to show me? What are you trying to teach me? You know, what are what? Are, just, just why me and why now? And what, what, what are you trying to show me? What are you, mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. what, what's the cause of this, et cetera? Those, those type questions. Wow. So what are some of the most challenging things you've experienced post transplant? Like walk us through, you get this phone call. Right. You know, because there are many of us out here. I, I personally happen to have on my driver's license that I'm a donor. 
right? An mm -hmm. organs owner. There are many people, our friends and family members that are like, why would you even tell? Why would you put that on your drive? Why would you even, you know? But talk to us about that process. You get this phone call. That well, not, not a phone call. They came. They came case, to my no. room. They they came to my Correct, room. We got organs because I was in the hospital. Yeah, and so um, you know, I, I was excited. I was um, I was happy about it. Uh, the sobering thing, though, for me is that in order for me to live, someone else had to die, and that that's a sober reminder and. The unfortunate thing is in New yes. York, they don't allow you to share that information unless the family wants it shared. And so I know I don't know who my donor was, um, don't know anything about him. Um, but you know, it's it's humbling in order for, for me to live, someone had to die. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is definitely humbling because while we rejoice on this end, right, and you are able to share that you are a living testimony, there is a family that as you are receiving what they were planning a funeral, right? right? Exactly. And so exactly. that is a very sobering uh, concept. And, and, um, and I have heard from several individuals that are not, not in your position, but on the opposite side that have lost lost loved ones and donated. Um, I, I had a conversation with someone as we prepared for this show and she shared that her goddaughter uh, was a young woman who passed away and her mother would get letters about where her child's body parts, if you will, were donated. So right. some of her skin was used for research. Her eyes, right. you know, her, um, you know, just, just different body parts were used for um other individuals and for research for people to be able to to improve uh, science, medical science. So, right, right. and while we're talking family, those of you that are watching, you feel free to ask questions, right, right. make comments in the chat. We'll able, I'll be able to see them. Pastor Jeff will be able to see them. And we wanna be able to address any questions or concerns you might have. I don't want my questions to be the only questions for Pastor Jeff tonight, because I realize that indeed there are so many that are rejoicing with him, rejoicing with us. And there's so many that have questions about this. And so, uh, Pastor Jeff, now talk to us uh, about how long was your healing process, if you will, or the process after surgery? How long was the surgery? The surgery, uh, I believe they said it was about 17, 18 hours. And the mm. healing process. So, so from the time that I finally went in the hospital on August the 25th, I was in the hospital, had a transplant, had done recovery, had gone to physical therapy, and I was home in 60 days. I was home exactly 60 days from the time I went into the hospital for the transplant. Amazing. My God. The, the, the biggest challenge I had when I came back uh, to the house after 60 days uh, was climbing up three little stairs to get into the house. <laughs> that was the biggest challenge. Mm. Uh, it's, 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 wow. been, it's been, it's been a great process. It's been a great recovery. Um, I am in the process of doing cardiac rehab now. Uh, that is a very intense workout in which you're monitored. Uh, I could go to the gym and work out, but I wouldn't necessarily be monitored. So they want to make sure that everything is working properly. I'm monitored. I have to do that for about nine more weeks, but that's going great. And I, I, I don't know if I got a teenager's heart, but I feel like a teenager. <laughs> really? Wow. Wow. And uh, so so tell me about the kidney now. Like, so while your heart was giving you some challenges, your kidney was also giving you challenges. Right. Right. So the kidney was not Correct. functioning properly. And were you ever even being considered... For a kidney transplant as well, yes, yes. And uh, ideally, they wanted to do the two at the same time. And what is the risk of that? Is that very common or? Well, they, what they wanted to do was they wanted to, because I was getting a new heart and the kidney was already weak. Um, so first of all, my heart wasn't pumping enough to pump 
um, to pump the, my body so that my body wasn't functioning, which meant my kidney was strained and it wasn't functioning. So it wasn't, a heart wasn't pumping enough, strong enough. So all the water, so I would retain water. Uh, I would swell up and you can take the diuretics, the drugs, Lasix and some of the other drugs. They, they gave me a drug strong enough for a horse. Uh, but you could take some of the drugs, but after a while, they stopped working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so now you're on. You're also on medication that you have to take for the rest of your life, correct? I am on uh, anti-rejection medications that I have to take uh, for the rest of my life. Yes, and and um, post transplant, I was going every week to make sure that they, there was no rejection. Uh, I graduated from every week to every other week. Then I graduated to once a month. And after my last biopsy, which was the first week of March, now I go every two weeks until the one year anniversary. And then I'll go once a year. Um, so there haven't been any signs of rejection. Um, I'm taking the medication. I have to take it, I have to be disciplined to take it. And I'll take it the rest of my life. Wow, that is absolutely here. amazing. You're here. Yeah. Look, there's some people that have to take, you know, take medicine every day for the rest of their lives that have not been through half of what you've been through, right? And you're still able to move and shake and do your trip. Now, what about travel? How is How has your life been altered other than taking meds and having surgery? How has your life now been altered? Is your diet changed? Has your activities my 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 diet has changed um and initially right post transplant when i came home uh they didn't want me to eat out at restaurants because of the risk of infection um there's some things that i can never eat again um i can i can never eat oysters again uh i can never eat pomegranate what? again i know you love that yes yes I really? can never, I, but I, I've got to be disciplined. I cannot eat star fruit. There's certain things that I can't eat because they interact with and have an effect uh, with the uh, anti-rejection drugs. Yeah. But, you know, uh, if I if I order a pizza, I cannot have the uh, pizzeria cut the pizza. I have to cut it at home myself. So if I order a pizza, I've got to order the whole pie and I've got to cut it myself just to keep down risk of infection and rejection. Can't go to a deli. Can't go and, to... and so the, the yeah, bacteria because, because like in the blade and that type of thing. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Can't 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 go to Jerry Sub and get a sub sandwich because of the bacteria possibility of cross contamination, bacteria on the blade. So, but one of the good things about it is because I couldn't eat out, which I've done most of my life, uh, I've really gotten <laughs> into cooking. I've really gotten into cooking. I'm Chef Jeff now. And most of my meals are made. Oh, at home. Chef I'm Jeff. Yeah. I always, in, now, I always I enjoy Now, I do know because, I'm, that because I know I'm your Facebook friend, I'm your friend. You just bought, what is the new thing that you just bought that is like your favorite new toy? Tell tell everybody um, watching, your favorite new toy. A pizza oven, a wood-fired pizza <laughs> oven. <laughs> So I don't yes, even go out yes, and buy yes. anymore. I can make I can make pizza just as good as the pizzeria. <laughs> right, 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 right. That's really great. And so, and you were telling me something about you said you feel like you had a young person's heart. Uh, somebody does have a question, and I'm going to get to that in just a moment. Um, you said you feel like you have a young person's heart, and you feel much younger. Um, are you just saying that, or is that like, do you really feel like? Yo, this the person's heart like that I have must really be. Do you feel like you have a different heart? I I I, I definitely feel like that. I mean, uh, I feel like I feel like uh, they must have been a singer because I break out and sing in worship right now, even though I might not be on key. But I definitely feel like it was. You know, I feel <laughs> energized. I feel younger. Um, I preach for a friend of mine on Palm Sunday, Reverend Lemuel Mobley in Brooklyn at the Livingstone Baptist Church. And I remember a time when you walk in the church, you have to go upstairs and then you have to go mm -hmm. up another set of stairs to get to his office, which I call the upper room. I remember a time when I would go preach for him 
and I just make it up the first flight of stairs. There's no way I was going to his office. But that Sunday I went. I'll wait for you right here, Reverend. <laughs> <laughs> I ran up the stairs. And his son said, do you want to go up, this, up up to the office? I said, yeah, sure, let's go. I ran up the stairs to go to the office. So I definitely feel more energy, feel more energized. Um, feel I, I really do feel like I'm a teenager. I'm not going to do everything a teenager wow. tries, but I do feel like I'm a teenager. So that's a great segue for this question because uh, someone said, um, and I'm not going to tell you who it is, but the person says, are there any challenges you won't try at this point in life? Zip lining, parasailing, long cruises or airline flights, et cetera. Are there any things that you wouldn't try? Um, and, and I'm not sure what it is, but um, this has been a very liberating experience. And I feel freer now than I've ever felt in my life. Uh, there's probably there's probably not much I wouldn't try now. Mm, my Lord. Uh, so somebody want to take same, me to line? So Somebody, well, that same person is also, I don't know if they gonna, if they trying to take you zip lining, but that same person said, they're still waiting for those pizza pies to come through those church doors. <laughs> so I, think, I think there's some folk at the Amity Baptist Church that are waiting for the pizza pies, Pastor, so. <laughs> we, 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 we're going to have a, we're going to have a pizza party soon. All right. And they said it's on. So let me ask you this. So you said um, you even long flights. So like if we were to say we're planning a trip to South Africa, would you be able to do that? Or are there certain things? I know people that have been on dialysis. They also have to make sure that there's a dialysis center nearby. And although are there, are there any things that you have to be aware of prior to traveling to a particular place? Um, just get, just get, um, kind of clearance from my doctors and my cardiologists and so forth. Um, they didn't want me flying anywhere. I mean, they didn't want me to take a hour flight, two hour flight to see my mom initially, but a lot of that is freed up. Uh, they wanted me to be conscientious of wearing a mask most of the time when I'm around large crowds. And, uh, but mo a lot of that stuff is freed up now that I'm, um, six, seven months out. Uh, usually there, there's about six months that there are some really stringent restrictions, but they start to free up. And especially if we haven't had signs of infection or, or rejection at this point. So, yeah. That is beautiful. And all other organs within your body, do you see a difference in, let's just say your skin or, you know, um, just, just in general, do you see, a, do you feel like you, there's a difference? Um, I do feel like there's a difference and I actually see a difference. Um, I, I guess your kidney, your kidney affects your skin because my skin yep. used to be a lot darker than it is now. I feel like I've gotten a shade or two lighter without even bleaching myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> interesting. Interesting. Family, are there any questions? We are opening up the lines now for you all to share your questions. If there's anything you'd like to share, just go ahead and drop it in the chat. We will go ahead and share it, Pastor Jeff. And Pastor Jeff, let me ask you this question. What would you say to someone who is in your position, someone that may be having heart challenges, someone that may be having kidney challenges, uh, and you know may have experienced some of the same fears or intrepidations that you've felt, right, what right, would right, you right. share with them? Well, and, and, and on one hand, that could be a hypothetical question, but it, it's absolutely not a hypothetical question because I have two very dear friends uh, who are facing those challenges even right now. Uh, one of them was the first person to the hospital when I passed out, the first pastor to the hospital when I passed out in 2018. He let, he, they mm -hmm. were in the midst of worship. He got words that I had passed out and he left his worship service. He had a guest preacher there. He left his worship service to come to the hospital. And he's facing some heart challenges right now. And just a few weeks ago, when I say, when I say that I've been saved from some stuff so that I can be saved for some stuff, I just, I needed to go see him. And I walked in the hospital and said to him, I'm here so that you can see some encouragement so that you can see some mm. encouragement and certainly you know mm -hmm. we had the conversations about my experiences and some of his fears and some of his 
anxieties. So this is an opportunity for me to minister to him. Um, and then a few, a few weeks or a few days later, I got a call from another preacher who had just gone through a kidney transplant and he had, he had gotten a kidney and he wanted to talk through the process. Um, he mm -hmm. wanted to just kind of run by what the doctors were saying and see what my challenges and my experiences were. So um, in that, my test, my trial really became a testimony as well. And so um, I, I welcome that opportunity to share with people um, what I've experienced. Uh, it, it's so ironic because just as I was uh, preparing for this, I was pondering and there was a young lady, one of the uh, young adults in Amity Baptist Church who said to me one day, she said, um, Pastor, can I talk to you about something I'm struggling with? And I said, sure. And she said, I think you do a great job expounding upon the text and teaching us what the word of God says and teaching us what, what to do. She said, but this is the thing. And, and she was younger. So this younger generation is looking for this. They're looking for transparency. She said mm -hmm. to me, she said, I Absolutely. don't get the feeling that you've ever had to go through anything. And I didn't understand it then, but I understand it post-transplant because, you know, mm -hmm. God does save us from stuff so he can save us for stuff. And there's sometimes that you can't, be, you can be used in a greater way after you have been broken. And so that during that whole process, I'm asking, Absolutely. Lord, why am I broken? Why, why am I broken? And mm. um, the thing I had to get to realize is, as the song says, there's beauty in our brokenness. There's blessing in our brokenness. And so mm. now that brokenness has allowed me to be a blessing and a testimony to other people. And so with that being said, you know, somebody's asking, um, how has this experience changed your witness? But I'd also like to take it a step further. Not only how has this experience changed your witness, but how has it changed your worship and your preaching? OK, so it, it's definitely changed um, my witness and my worship. Um, again, I, I'm freer than I have ever been in my life. I, I spent a lot yeah. of time. I've spent a lot of time and a lot of years uh, trying to please people and trying to make sure that they thought well of me. And I'm at the point now where, and some of that was, I can reflect on and say some of it was being inauthentic, not being who I really am. And so I'm much more authentic now. Uh, it has inspired, it has emboldened, it has enlightened and enhanced my preaching as well as my worship. Um, I, um, we, we, during that period, I was saying that one of the things that, that kept me going was that I looked at Job and I started writing reflections. Of, I'm probably going to come out with a memoir uh, at some <laughs> point. And it's based on the life of Job. And I started asking myself um, the question, why I was going through what I was going through, et cetera. And I came to the point where I said to myself, you preach this every Sunday. Now you've got to live it right now. If you've never lived yes. it before, the, the word has become real. And you've yes. got to you've got to do that. You've got to live it. You preach trust. You preach faith. You've got to live it. And what this this experience brought me closer to God. This experience, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, the song says, oh, for grace to trust him more. This, yes. this experience allowed me to trust God more. Yeah. Yeah. It made yeah. me yeah. trust God. And, and it's interesting that you chose that song because. Absolutely. There was a season um, a few years ago that um, I was on the shores of Jamaica, right? Looking out on the water and that 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 particular line of that song of that hymn kept playing in my mind. And one of the things that God began to talk to me about is the fact that I know you trust me, but the song doesn't say just trust me. The song says, oh, for grace 
to trust, to trust me more. more. And he began to tell me that I need you to trust me more. You trust me this far, but I need you to trust me even in these dark places, even in these uncomfortable places. You trust me, but I need you to do it more. And sometimes I would dare say that God pushes us into places and predicaments in order for us to have to trust him more. And um, and so you, what you've been through, what you've had to go through has been, if you you couldn't rely on the doctors. You couldn't rely on the deacons. You couldn't rely on the ministerial staff. You couldn't rely on your mom. You couldn't rely on your brother, right? You had to trust God, right? And not just trust God, um, but you have to trust who God placed in that right. operating room right. as well. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, my, my, my mentor, Dr. Gary Simpson, uh, he knows me probably better than a whole lot of people. And uh, he knows that, uh, one of the things is I like to be in charge. I like to be in charge. I, I, I feel like sometimes I need to be in charge. One of the things he said to me, um, cause we, we were having conversations. We had real conversations because I didn't know how this process was going to end. And, and Absolutely. I needed to, I needed to make preparations. So we were having conversations and he said to me, he said, you know, even when you thought you were in charge, you need to know that God was ultimately in charge. And, and, and you're Always. absolutely right. Oh, for grace to trust him more. I, I know you trust me, but I need you to trust me more. And that's one of the reasons that uh, there's not a whole lot that I won't try now, because I, I even <laughs> trust God to take care of me <laughs> even more. Yeah. 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 And they say to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's so, true. hey. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so um, um, someone's asking in the chat also. Um, are there support groups for transplanters or persons that have transplanted in? Are you a part of one? How? What are some of the tools that you've employed to move through this? Um, what is your devotional time like? Or it, has that been impacted as one who has experienced or received um, an, an implant? Yes, the, um, a transplant. <laughs> Uh, not an implant, sorry, <laughs> transplant. <laughs> I was like, what, what do you got me like, here That's doing? a whole other show. That's a whole other show. <laughs> uh, so, I'm not sure I would be a part of that one, but um, yes, there are, <laughs> yes there, there, there are support groups. There, there are support groups. Northwell has a support group um, that I attend on a bi-monthly basis. So there, there are support Ooh. groups. And that support group is is vital. It's vital um, because you know there's there's a newness. There's a whole new way of life. There's a whole new discipline that you've got to adopt. And so that's affected my uh, prayer life. That's affected my devotional life. Again, it's affected my preaching, my worship, my witness. Um, and 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 I've, I'm probably more disciplined now. Than I've ever been as well. I'm a, I'm a great procrastinator, but I'm probably more disciplined mm -hmm. now than I've ever been. Wonderful, wonderful. One of your um, ministers has said that it's been transformational for those at Amity as well. So yeah. this does not just impact yeah. you, but has also impacted your members in your church. How does your family and your friends and your community, your circle, how do they receive you, interact with you and respond to you now? Um, I, I've got a great, great uh, cadre of friends, family, church has been great. Um, everyone is excited. Everyone. And, and let me just say that I am the product of many people's prayers. I am the answer. I'm the evidence of the answer prayers, uh, associations, uh, EBA, the, the state convention, churches. I, I was at a um, banquet a few weeks ago and there's a 97 year old lady who said, I didn't know who you were, but we were praying for you. My pastor said, pray for you. And I pray for you every day. And she, she was just excited to get to meet me. Um, and the, the, the Sunday that I came back to Amity, uh, and, I, and I did come back a little earlier than the doctors told me, but uh, the Sunday that I came back was my pastoral anniversary Sunday. And we had a great time. It was a great worship experience. It was a very high spirited service. Uh, they were glad to see me, and I was certainly glad to see them as well after being in a hospital for 60 days and being laid up for a month at home. Yes. I was certainly yeah. glad to see them. But um, all my friends have been very supportive. 
Um, I wouldn't have got this transplant um, except for one of the one of the requirements was that you had to have a support team. And most of my family is not in New York. I have an uncle that's in New York. And I have a few cousins that are in New York. So friends of mine, ministers, uh, friends, and, and a few people at the church made up that support team uh, to be there during the transplant and to be there post-transplant. So everyone has, you know, uh, been been great. They've wow. just been great and supportive. Okay, and I have, she's saying that there's a question from someone who's unable to log in. Um, they would like to know, what would you say to those with chronic illness after your experience? It's like, what would, how would you minister to someone now with chronic illness as opposed to how you may have ministered to them prior to this experience? Um, probably much more, um, I'm not sure empathy is the right word, but um, yeah, maybe empathy is the right word. Maybe empathy is the right word. Um, much more um, empathy. Um, I would, you know, encourage them as much as possible. Um, but yeah, empathy is the word. A lot more empath empathetic and um, just hopeful uh prayerful those are some words that come to mind mm -hmm. so what's on your to-do list now now that you have uh, and we're getting ready to wrap up the show but now uh now, now that you have this new teenager's heart and, <laughs> and, and this new uh up uh, there's another question. These questions are rolling in now. Now, we, I guess people are starting to, they said, have you ever thought of starting a trauma group at a ch at church? I, I have a feeling that these are Amity folks that are trying to use living the liberated life to get pastor to, <laughs> to, no, to, I, I have thought to of share I have what you of. say. Well, you said on that show that you <laughs> You have thought about no, I, it. Okay, I, wonderful, yeah, wonderful, I have, wonderful. I have so, thought about um, it. So what I was Okay. All right. And we're going to continue to pray with you about that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah. on my bucket list, on my bucket list, uh, yeah. I, um, I, I do, I want to, I want to dive deep into this cooking and um, baking because um, I used to not be able to find relaxation except I'm, I'm an avid fisherman. I'm an avid golfer. I'm an avid boat, uh, boater. And now I'm an avid chef. Um, and so I find relaxation in those things. So one of the things um, in my life, I've always lived for what was next, what was coming next. And when I say what was coming next, I mean in and everything, whatever is next. I'm looking for the next thing. And so I've, I've learned how to just be present in the moment, enjoy the moment, be grateful for the moment, be appreciative for the moment and live for the moment. But one of the things I do yeah. want to do is I want to run a marathon at least a half marathon, at least a half marathon. And that's from someone, that's from someone who never liked running. I, I didn't, I didn't play soccer because you had to run around too much, but I do want to run a marathon, a half marathon. Okay. Somebody said in the kitchen with chef Jeff, in they the got you with in a Jeff cooking Jeff. show, pastor. <laughs> they are ready. <laughs> But now one promise though, once you perfect your best dessert and your and you perfect your best uh your best dish, I get to taste first. Bet that's bet. Well, maybe that's not first, because I you know I want other folks to try it first. I gotta be somewhere in the first batch. You gotta make a you know, <laughs> you gotta make a, a pie cake or something for me. All right. I'll I'll, I'll tell you what. I'm I'm gonna, all I'm right, gonna wonderful. I'm going to treat you and your husband to dinner. I'm going to cook a dinner for you guys. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. We're going to come over there and we are going to get Yeah, We want, I don't know if I, I don't know if I just want the pizza though. I might want you to get some other skills up. I, I got other skills. I got other skills. I do a whole get some other dishes bowl. under your belt. I do a whole seafood bowl for you. All right, all right. Now that is my ministry. 
That is my ministry. We can do that. We can do that. <laughs> so, Pastor Jeff, I ask everyone this at the end of my shows. I ask everyone, as you know, the name of this show is Living the Liberated Life with Dr. KJ. And so I'd like to close out the show asking you two things, though. One, what is your last liberating thought? And what is the thing that what are the top three things, lessons that you believe you learned through this challenge and you'd like to bless somebody else? With. Um, all, all of them are related. Um, the three things that I've learned uh, to slow down, to live and appreciate the moment and don't take time for granted. That's good. Yeah, That's good. And that is a liberating thought right there. Slow down. Pastor Jeff says, slow down. We're buzz. We're busy running from A to B and this and that. I got another meeting. I got another call. I got another... And then you said, take time to enjoy life, right? Because when it's gone, it's gone. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Wow, that's powerful. That is powerful. And someone is saying that there is the New York City 13-mile marathon. It happens in the springtime. So you got some time to heal. And next spring, we want to see you running that marathon. Now, we may not be running with you. We may be on the sidelines with pom-poms. <laughs> <laughs> Come on and run with me. Come on and run with me. Uh, God bless you. I'm not running. <laughs> But um, but Pastor Jeff, I really want to thank you because indeed you have been a friend, um, and I, we both have experienced a whole lot over this past year, um, and but yet and still we've been connected, and I'm grateful to God first for allowing you to see another day, allowing you to live to be a testimony. I want to thank you for sharing your your life and your testimony with so many others. I know I'm not the first person that has asked you to share on this show or share in any other capacity. But I believe that there's someone that may be scrolling late at night. There may be someone who is checking it us, checking this out right now. Someone that's about to go through something and their friend, their family member, or their neighbor will be able to share this interview, not in real time, but they will be able to share it in days, weeks, months, years to come. And your life will continue to impact the lives of others simply because you have, you are a living testimony. I can't say that enough. We always say, I want to be a testimony. Oh, I'm a testimony. But you know, uh, Pastor Jeff, you get the testimony award for today. All right. Amen. Sarah, name me. Sarah, name me. <laughs> me? No, I'm not singing on today. Hallelujah. We, 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 we know, we know you have a great voice. <laughs> we know. Okay. Well, well, let's do it together. I am a living, a living testimony. testimony. I should have been, been dead, dead and gone. gone. Yes. But, but the, the Lord, Lord let me live on. Amen. Yes. That's all you're getting tonight. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Well, we thank God for you, Pastor Jeff. We thank God for you, 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 and you that have joined us tonight. We hope that you have subscribed to Living the Liberated Life with Dr. KJ, and we hope you will be able to be a part of many more episodes to come. We are so glad that God has allowed you to pass our way today and you have enjoyed the show if you've enjoyed the show just say i enjoyed it i enjoyed it i enjoyed it i'm inspired i'm inspired we want to encourage each and every one of you to continue to follow us to continue to live slow down and live life to its fullest so with that being said as i always say live liberated have a great night bye-bye bye-bye <laughs>